you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to come. I really appreciate it. So um, if you can see a screen from where you're sitting, um, my talk goes along with, with um, a slideshow. So I'm going to take it back uh, a second to the beginning. I grew up in Northern California. I grew up in Sonoma County, just a couple hours north of here. And I grew up out in an apple orchard. And it was a pretty bucolic setting. Um, my parents had a big vegetable garden. We cooked with vegetables and fruits a lot. We were um, actually vegan for most of my growing up. I'm not anymore. But um, that was sort of the basis of my learning how to cook and what I was exposed to, which um, has definitely informed what I'm doing today. Um, so as a kid, I was really into uh, photography and painting. I took uh, watercolor painting classes uh, from the time I was five years old. Um, and then I always, like, I always had one of those um, disposable cameras <laughs> that I took around with me. I was taking photos and setting up my cousins for photo shoots in the backyard and in the orchard. And um, those two elements um, have really uh, come together in my recent work. So um, for college, I uh, studied art. And I come from a family that's very supportive of that. So my parents were like, great, be an art major. <laughs> Not sure what you're going to do next, but awesome. We support you. Um, and then after, the, after I graduated from college, I decided that I was going to move to New York to become a photographer. And I didn't really know what that meant. Um, but I knew I loved photography. And I knew all the magazines were there. And so I just thought I'd go and try it, maybe for a year. But it ended up being about nine years. <laughs> So um, during that time, I worked at a magazine in a photo department and for several different photographers in their studios. And I also babysat and worked at a restaurant and walked dogs and did a million things to try and kind of be an artist in New York. And then finally, I decided that I was going to go back to school because I wanted to teach photography. And so that takes me to this first slide, which is um, two different photos that I took. Um, in grad school, I went to um, School of Visual Arts, and I did an MFA in photography. And um, they sort of said in the beginning, go out and take photos of whatever you're drawn to, and then bring them back. And we'll see what your focus might be. And I just kept seeing myself taking photos of food. It was just all these colors and textures. And um, I was just so drawn to, to food in general. Um, but because I was vegetarian, <laughs> I ended up shooting a lot of uh, desserts because they're colorful, they're vegetarian, they're um, delightful to shoot, they have all the texture. But I wasn't really satisfied with just taking a photo of them like on a table or on a white backdrop. Um, so I started playing around with these other elements. So this photo right here, or these two photos, are uh, pages that I took out of magazines. And I propped them in the back of a studio setup. And I was trying to sort of create this little fantastical word, world for a dessert. And I wanted them to be funny and silly and, and colorful uh, and playful. So this is just the, the early days of my photography. And I think it's actually very similar to uh, what I'm doing now. There's a lot in the middle, though. <laughs> So here's a few more of those dessert shots. You can see there's different pages for magazines in the backdrop, sort of pretending as if these desserts are placed in an old palace or in a grand um, ballroom. So these are examples of two different photographers that I was really influenced by at this time. Um, the one on the right, the watermelon, or sorry, on, the, on your left, <laughs> um, is uh, by Irving Penn, who is a famous photographer. He, he shot a lot for Vogue. He did a lot of fashion, but also a lot of still life. And his, his images are very much set up, very um, purposefully uh, styled and, and, and put together. So that, that watermelon is perfectly placed there with, with that bread in the foreground and those grapes in the background. And that was his setup shot. Versus the other shot is my, by Martin Parr. Um, and he's a photographer who is still working today. And he's a photojournalist. So a very different way of thinking about photography. Um, roaming around maybe um, at the farmer's market or um, at a restaurant or you know, wherever you happen to see food and just trying to snap a quick photo and hope you catch that that magical moment. So I was somewhere in between these two worlds of thought. Like I loved being out at the farmer's market and grabbing, you know, getting some great shot of a girl in a red dress behind the red apples and think, oh, I like caught that moment. You know, that was like satisfy satisfying. But also I really enjoyed the styling and the setup of the photo. So I, through grad school, I was sort of playing with those two sides of my, my interests. 
Um, this was my thesis project when I was in grad school. And I had read an article about um, this chef. His name was Will Goldfarb. Um, and he, has anyone heard of him? He has a couple of cookbooks out. He's still working. Um, so he, I had read this article about him, and he made these amazing um, desserts that I was totally inspired by. And I thought, I have got to go to this guy's restaurant. So I went down uh, to Soho, and I just got a seat at the bar one night by myself. And he was behind the bar. And I started talking to him. And I'm very shy. This was like not in my comfort zone. But I was like really drawn to what he was doing with food and colors and ideas and translating that all in the kitchen space. And so I asked him. Um, Pretty bluntly, I said, I'm a photography student. I'm looking to photograph some really interesting desserts. Would you be open to um, letting me photograph what you've made here? And he was really receptive and so nice and invited me to come. And I, I spent months um, going into the restaurant and uh, photographing his creations. So um, for my, my final project was uh, in the form of a book. And it was two images next to each other. So the one on the right is his creation. And then I used all the uh, ingredients from that dish and did my own sort of collage interpretation of that, that dish. So those are the ingredients that go into that dish in a sort of abstract presentation. <laughs> so here's a couple more of those. So again, this one, the citrus and the vanilla um, and the, the berries, they all go into that, that dessert that he created that's on the right. But this is sort of the early signs of my interest in diptychs, two, in, two images that really work together to tell a story about food and um, showing not only, you know, breaking down a recipe and thinking about it not only in terms of ideas, but in terms of color and form and shape and thinking of it in a very graphic way um, that's tangible, right? Like you order that dessert in a restaurant, and you, unless you read the menu description, you have no idea what's really in it, right? So I love the idea of breaking it down in image form um, to see what, what went into it. So also around that time, I was doing a lot of um, photojournalistic work in restaurants and shooting chefs. Um, and again, it's that idea of kind of catching, getting lucky in the moment and catching uh, the photo. Uh, this was a more setup shot that I did in a restaurant, um, just with a piece of black velvet in a, in a window um, in a dining room <laughs> using some, um, some very small flashes that I had brought with me. And, um, but I, I was really drawn to the colors and the graphic notion of these shapes and forms working together to show what I was hoping would be a more interesting display of a charcuterie plate. <laughs> but of course, it's the chef's plating and his, and his um, you know, idea that went into the way that dish looks. But I was trying to really capture the, the essence of it. Um, during that time, I was also shooting a lot of photojournalistic type work as a volunteer photographer at the James Beard Foundation. And I would go maybe one night a month, and they would have a volunteer photographer in the kitchen with all these amazing and famous chefs that would come through. Um, and I would get to be right next to them. It was you know, so small, like much smaller than this kitchen. It's actually um, the apartment of James Beard. He was a contemporary of Julia Child. Um, and his home was turned into a foundation and also a very interesting dining space if you're ever in New York. <laughs> but. Um, Anyways, that was a good way for me to build my portfolio and get exposure to a lot of different chefs and types of food and um, connect with chefs that I could then go to their restaurants in New York and do some more photography. This was my first um, magazine cover of Edible Manhattan, some soup in a window. And again, it's that kind of photojournalistic type shot that um, is somewhat set up, but also um, photojournalistic. And this is my first shot in uh, the New York Times, which was a big goal of mine. This was in 2007. And I was so excited to photograph this restaurant. It ran in the dining section. So when I finished grad school, I um, started teaching. So I had a degree in photography. And Photoshop was sort of my favorite part of all of that. And so um, I started teaching digital photography and Photoshop at FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology. And I was uh, teaching photography and also freelancing as a food photographer, mostly food photographer, some other kinds of photography too, um, during that time. This was a restaurant shot that I did as a freelancer. And if you'll take a look at the, the kind of style and lighting of these shots, um, 
It's uh, you know, black backgrounds, white backgrounds, um, bright lighting, harsh shadows. Um, so I'll just fast forward to <laughs> what came next is driving up Highway 84. I don't know if you guys have ever driven up to Skyline in Woodside. It's only about a half an hour from here. But uh, my husband got a job here uh, about seven years ago, and we uh, came out. We were living in New York and came out on a whirlwind weekend. We didn't know where we were going to live, and we are just like looking at all these different ads. We thought we'd probably live in Mountain View, and um, just by chance found an ad for this really cool cabin up in, up in Woodside. And as we were driving this road, I was like, there's no way we're going to live up here. This road is crazy. Can you imagine driving this every day? <laughs> um, but once we got there, we got to look at the view. And we're like, OK, how far is this to the office? <laughs> Maybe the road isn't that bad. And um, you know, it's like a, totally one, a, a total 180 from living in Brooklyn right? to go um, to the woods, <laughs> even if it is technically Silicon Valley. <laughs> And as we were leaving, they said, you know, um, there is actually like a small studio on the property that you could use for your work. And because we were thinking, oh, the cabin's like a little small. I don't know, will it work for us? And then the studio part was like, oh, OK, this could really work. I could see my work you know, taking a, a different turn here. Um, so there's something um, about the light here that was very special. So um, because we're so close to the coast, there's a lot of fog that's rolling in. So I don't know if you can see that fog um, rolling by. But that's just sort of like the view right out of the kitchen. And the deck is right there um, in front of the kitchen. And um, if you study photography and ever used a, a, a soft box, you know that the, having that soft light is really hard to achieve. And um, a really desirable type of light for shooting food. So I thought. We have like a light box in the sky here. This is amazing. I don't even need studio lights anymore. I can just shoot outside. It's like all right here. The light is amazing. And then also just being so close to the coast and being maybe California, everything was so um, golden. The light was really golden, which I love for, for photographing. While she's advancing, I had a question about the lighting. So sure. how much of the lighting do you have to do nowadays with technology? The old school way of setting up versus how much can you do after the fact? Yeah, because, good question. Again, Google Photos does a lot of great things yeah. work with, with, with um, lighting after the fact, mm -hmm. and it's much easier, but is it a better result? So it's kind of a. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that you can do now after the fact. You can really kind of save yourself, <laughs> um, which is good when you're learning. But um, I try to get as much as I can into the shot. There's always a lot more color um, quality and detail in the shot. Um, if you just get it right there in the camera, um, you can fix a lot um, after the fact. I, I do pretty, even though I love Photoshop, <laughs> I don't use it so much to um, fix the photos or retouch them that much. Um, it's usually just kind of an overall color cast shift or adding a little bit of contrast or um, you know cropping, things like that. I'll show you how I use Photoshop in a different, more illustrative way also. But um, for shooting, I love to get it in the shot as much as I can. Yeah. Um, so here's just another shot of, I started playing around with cooking outside. <laughs> and we had just gotten this um, membership to a, a CSA box, a, a community supported agriculture farm box. Does anybody subscribe to one of these? They're great. Yeah, so some of them you can choose what you get each week. And some of them you just kind of get a box and you're not really sure what's going to show up. And so we're getting this box. And every week I thought, you know, we actually got to choose um, eight items each week you know, of a limited offering. And I was always choosing the most colorful things that I thought would be really fun to photograph. And um, that was really the, the impetus for the whole um, Forest Feast project. So I started out thinking, OK, I'm going to just start taking photos. I've never worked with chefs in the Bay Area. I'm going to just start cooking some really simple things myself to take photos of so that I can make a new portfolio. Because in the past, I'd always worked with chefs who had made the dishes, and I would photograph them. But I thought, I love cooking. I grew up cooking. You know, I can make some really simple things. I'll keep it you know, under five ingredients, simple steps. Um, and I didn't really know where I was going with this, but I thought I'd, I'd start a website or a blog. And I called it The Forest Feast, since we just moved to the forest, and I love alliteration. Um, and I uh, just started posting photos. And the first couple photos, it's pretty clear that um, I didn't know what I was doing yet. <laughs> 
um, I was just really experimenting with these local ingredients and trying to figure it out. And then one day, I was getting sort of tired of photographing things on a tablecloth or just on my wooden table. Um, and I had met with a couple editors in San Francisco who said my those black and white, harsh, light, slick looking photos weren't really like the, the vibe they were going for here for, for West Coast magazines and um, maybe cookbooks that were, were here that I was hoping to shoot other people's cookbooks. And they said, you know, we just need a little bit more of a natural vibe. And I was so tired of my, my wooden table, I thought, I'm just going to walk outside. So one day I had a plate of acorn squash that I had cooked that had come in that CSA box. And I was just sort of walking around and I, I just started putting the plate down in the forest, like in our backyard, <laughs> looking for old stumps and mossy logs and a pile of leaves, but trying to bring in kind of like a natural element, but also different colors and textures and, um, and shapes that might, um, you know, give it a different look. This is the, an early version of uh, my Forest Feast website. And I just treated it as a blog. I was sharing recipes, but I got sort of bored by just typing out the recipe and I thought, I could show this visually. Maybe I should make kind of a diagram and show the ingredients, sort of like I had been doing with my um, cookbook that I did in grad school, sort of showing the pieces that go into the final dish. I thought even, you know, we're so saturated with recipes online, especially if you want to like make something for dinner, you just want to scroll through and be like, I have that in my fridge. I think I can make that. And if you see a photo of it rather than reading through it all, it might be more immediate and also more kind of interesting to look at. Um, and I was also just inspired by my space, you know, being in this cabin, um, a different environment. I was sort of worried that my biggest career um, accomplishments might have been behind me in New York. It was hard to like leave so many years of building a photography business in New York and then just leave and think, what's next, you know? But I was pretty inspired by this new, this new space. So this was the first photo that was kind of my aha moment on my Forest Feast blog. And it's that acorn squash. And I was wandering around putting it on all these different surfaces. And there had been this tree that died. And they took it down. And, and I, I just set the, the, the cutting board down on that tree. And I thought, you know, all the, the colors and the shapes um, of that log really are mimicking the shapes and colors and textures of that acorn squash. And this is so much more interesting than my dining room table. And so that was the first, I think it was maybe my third post on my blog. And the first couple were just like, a bowl of fruit. Uh, but this was the first one where I was like, OK, maybe this is a good direction to try and explore. So I started doing a bunch more like this. And instead of just typing it out, I made um, a photo of the ingredients that went into the dish. And then I popped that into Photoshop. And I added my handwriting on top because I couldn't find a, photo, um, a font that I loved. And then I added just a little bit of typewriter font to fill in some, some details. And then I put the two together um, to make that diptych. Uh, like I said, I had always kind of thought in diptych form. I love these two images that work together, and they seem to lend um, themselves well to a website or a blog. So um, these are a few more examples of some of the photos. So again, this is a, a garlicky kale Caesar salad with polenta croutons. Um, and I thought that mossy log <laughs> sort of uh, worked well with it. So here's the recipe page for that, that salad. So I used an old book, because I'm always looking for some sort of um, either very dark or very light surface to add the text on top of in my shot. So I put a little piece of watercolor paper at the top. And remember, I had always loved watercolor painting, right? Um, but I always did it as a hobby, you know, painting little postcards and mailing them to people. And I always thought, you know, as a professional artist, you should probably choose one medium. Like, I chose photography, so I'm going to stick with that. But I never really thought about um, calling myself an illustrator or a painter. Um, but I thought, you know what? We just moved to the woods. I don't know what I'm doing with my life, and I'm going to start putting my paintings right on top of my photos and see what happens. It was fun. But I started to post them online, and people really kind of responded to that illustrative component of it. So you can see in Photoshop, I layered in uh, the Kale Caesar uh, painted font. So I just painted that on paper and scanned it and then put it in using Photoshop, along with all my handwriting. And then again, that diptych, so the two um, images working together. So here's just an example of a few of my little watercolor paintings, uh, which you'll see I'm wearing today. <laughs> I made it into some clothes, too. I'm wearing the book to the book talk. Um, here's a couple more um, examples of recipes that I was working with. So something that I was really uh, drawn to, and I think in part 
by my art school training. Um, I was also uh, studying sculpture when I was in school. So I was trying to think of these uh, plates as little sculptures. And I feel like that's the way Will Goldfarb, the chef that I had photographed the, the dishes of, um, he thought of his, I imagine that he thought of his plates as little sculptures or little sort of uh, pieces of art. So thinking about the dish more structurally, I thought maybe there's more interesting ways that I can cut things and layer things and think about sh different shapes um, and, and um, textures and um, colors going together for a dish, not only for the way it might taste, but for the way it might look when you're presenting it, right? It doesn't have to be that hard. You don't have to be um, you know, a, a traditionally trained chef to be able to make a beautiful dish, I think. So, um, and I have not gone to culinary school, by the way, remember. <laughs> I um, make very simple recipes um, and, and am inspired by, by color. So this dish, um, I, I chop the watermelon into big round slices and then I just remove the rind and then use the whole watermelon slab as sort of the basis for this dish. So you could use a large watermelon and cut it into pie pieces um, and share it or you can use those mini watermelons and just make a, a single one for, for each person. But it's a, a fun and maybe slightly different presentation than you may have seen before. Um, sort of inspired by a very, you know, traditional uh, summer salad, which is watermelon with some sort of cheese and herb, usually feta. But I um, tossed in some, some uh, mozzarella, fresh mozzarella slices, because I like the round shape um, that mimicked the, the round shape of the melon. And then I was also playing around with um, different styling. Um, you know, just trying to take things off the plate. <laughs> so in my photography, I was um, shooting this right before Thanksgiving, and there's all these beautiful fall leaves on the ground, I thought, I can't find a plate that I like really that much for these. They're white, they don't look good on a white plate. I'm just gonna try one of those leaves out there. So, you know, technically you could serve it like that if you have found some sort of edible leaf, but um, it worked well for the photo. Here's some apricot bites. Again, just thinking about different colors that go really well together. So the orange and the red and the green all playing off of each other, but also super simple. <laughs> So about six months into um, having this blog online, it was on Tumblr, um, it started to really gain some traction and I started getting people uh, reposting my recipes on their blogs and getting comments on my blog and I was like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I didn't expect anybody to see this except for like the, you know, the editor that I might like send a link to and I really didn't know anything about food blogging. I didn't even really follow food blogs that closely. Um, but about six months into it, um, a literary agent reached out, somebody from New York, and she said, um, you know, I saw your blog online and I think you should turn it into a book. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that. And she said, no, you're ready. Look at, look at your, your images right next to each other, those diptychs, those two uh, vertical images right next to each other, they lend themselves perfectly to the pages of a book. Like, it's already a book. <laughs> Let's turn it into one. And I really love some of the clients that she had worked with before who were bloggers turned cookbook authors. Um, so I said, okay, let's do it. So uh, she's been amazing. And so uh, help about mm, within a year of that, I guess about maybe six months after that, um, I got a book deal. And then it took about a year to create my first book, which is called The Forest Feast. And here it is. So just all vegetarian recipes and completely inspired by um, living in the woods. Here's a behind the scenes shot of my, my cover shoot. <laughs> um, it's basically just a piece of plywood and a kitchen chair. <laughs> and I'm standing on that chair, totally handheld, no tripod or anything, all natural light. Um, and my editor was on uh, the cell phone <laughs> in New York. And I'm always shooting in that late in the daytime, um, like about, you know, 4.30 or so when that golden hour kind of light comes in. Um, so for her, it was like 7.30 at night. So she was like at home with her kids and I'm taking pictures and texting them to her. And she's like, move the tomato over a little bit and pull that, you know, plate down over there. So a little bit of trial and error and we got the cover shot. That was during the cover, cover shot. But it's just, you know, this is a, a one woman show. It is me in the backyard. <laughs> And there's the end pages. We decided to use all those illustrations as the end pages for the book. Again, the dress. <laughs> 
So here's a few photos um, that are from that book. And um, I just thought I'd explain um, the Photoshop use in the, in the recipe side. Um, that was just a big, empty, white piece of kind of handmade paper that I bought at the paper store. I tacked it up on the fence. Um, and with the, the thought that that would be the title. So I was always trying to, in the real world, trying to think about, okay, I'm looking at this shot, where's the title gonna go? Where's my handwriting gonna go? I'm always trying to leave room for arrows and, and text while I'm shooting. Here's the bay potatoes. I picked some bay out back. And again, trying to think of those colors. I think, you know, um, layering potatoes like that. Um, in a pan has certainly been done so much, and I was just trying to uh, mix up the colors a little bit by adding some sweet potato and red onion. There's some stuffed tomatoes, trying to think about different ways to uh, cut the tomatoes and create vessels out of different types of vegetables to create an uh, interesting presentation that's also vegetarian and colorful and easy. <laughs> And then I also, for the book, did um, some more illustrated um, kind of sauce and um, dressing type recipes that were all illustrated. Um, I, I find it, I'm a visual learner, but I find it easier to look at the picture of all the ingredients and have a sense of how to make a dish rather than reading a lot of steps or a lot of text. Here's a couple cutting techniques that I, I drew out. And again, this page is totally made um, in Photoshop. So that brought me to our first baby, <laughs> Ezra. So I was pregnant with him on our uh, on the book tour for the first book, and soon after he was born. And soon after that, my editors uh, reached out and they said, we think you should adapt your, your book for kids. It's so visual, it already makes sense for kids to be able to look at these pictures and make something. So we took um, 20 recipes out of the first book and I created 20 new ones and we made the Forest Feast for Kids. And that came out in 2016. I had some kids over, um, friends that we knew, and they helped me um, cook on the deck. We did a workshop, and they gave me some really useful feedback, actually. <laughs> this one little boy said that he needed um, more examples of how to cut things, um, that he was interested in cutting things. So there was a whole, um, I think I included it in here. Yes, this was the cutting techniques inspired by Jacob. <laughs> he, um, he said, you know, just knowing which way to start and if you peel first or after. And um, so I thought, how could I show that really visually and make it easy, not only for me, but for kids? So it's aimed at kids who are 8 to 12 years old. There's a couple more photos from that book. So it could be a carrot uh, salad or it could be a rainbow carrot salad. We're lucky in California to have such um, colorful produce that's pretty um, accessible. I know right now we're getting rainbow carrots in our farm box, like this week. <laughs> So here's an example of how I set up that, that shot. Again, thinking about a high or low contrast item to have the text go over, which is that white piece of uh, canvas, layering the ingredients on top, and then painting individually painting different elements that um, would you know, add to the, to the diagram effect of the recipe. A little bit of handwriting and uh, a little bit of typewriter text. Here's an avocado, peanut butter avocado shake. <laughs> Trying to get those greens in the kids. <laughs> we have two kids, so now I know how hard it is to get them to eat vegetables. <laughs> so then, uh, soon after that, I had, you know, we love having people over, and I feel like um, everything that went into creating my first book was very much entertaining inspired. Um, and so it felt like a, a natural next step to do an entertaining book, which is the Forest Feast Gatherings, which you guys all have in front of you. Um, and that really just started with these dinner parties on our deck where I was experimenting, making dishes, or having shoot days where I made tons of dishes and needed friends to come over and help us eat everything. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, eating outside, I feel like, always makes everything better. So ideas for outdoor entertaining and hosting. Um, everything in this book uh, is laid out in menus. So, like, if you're hosting a summer dinner party, here's, like, five or six things that you could make. And if you don't have that much time, just make these three of them and buy these things. And so sort of hosting tips to make it easier. Because I think it's, you know, it can be hard to entertain, right? It's intimidating to, to think, oh my gosh, people are coming over to my house. I have to clean it. I have to get everything ready. It's so much prep. I have to start buying the groceries days in advance. I have to, you know, take the afternoon off work to make it all happen. And I don't think you have to. <laughs> so I was trying to give lots of really, like, practical ideas for how you could have people over and connect with people over good 
plant-based food um, and not stress yourself out too much. <laughs> so here's the brunch menu. It's a holiday cocktail party menu. And I have some little DIYs in there, like how to make that little floral garland that you could hang. Um, this is an example of one of the spreads. I feel like uh, this book is, to me, um, artistically kind of a, an evolution of my first book. Um, there's a lot more art and painting um, and kind of like a floral styling that's, that's in the, yeah, there you go. You have the page open right there. Um, you know, there's a lot more uh, of an artistic element to it, I think. Or it sort of evolved even more from the first book. And I even included a little painting, a little cabin painting. And for the contents page, you can see I just pulled like mossy sticks and leaves and things on the side and um, layered those on the edges just to make the page just a little bit more, more interesting. There's me cooking in our little kitchen. <laughs> and there's an aerial view at the bottom of, of the left hand page um, of where we live. So it's pretty, even though it's only about 35 minutes from here, um, it's pretty densely wooded. Here's a, one of the recipes from the book is za'atar roasted carrots. So I'm always trying to find kind of interesting um, elements of a dish that maybe you don't have in your kitchen, but are pretty readily available. So za'atar is a great spice blend. Has, has anyone cooked with za'atar before? Yeah, it's good, right? Um, it's a blend of a few different herbs and spices. And um, anyways, I can find it at my local grocery store. Often if I'm, if I'm at Safeway or um, Whole Foods or one of my local grocery stores, I, if I can't find a certain um, ingredient, I think, OK, other people aren't going to be able to find that either, so I'm not going to include it. Here's a roasted eggplant salad using some um, nasturtium, edible nasturtium flowers, which we actually have from the Google Garden today. They're so beautiful. <laughs> Here's a rice noodle bar. So a lot of my thinking also, um, which is what you'll see that we're going to sample later, is um, you know, so often we have friends over for dinner, and people have different dietary um, restrictions or preferences. And um, I wanted to give some options for things that you could serve that could kind of work for any number of things. So the rice noodle bar is um, gluten-free and vegan, which is a good one. The, we're going to have the polenta bar here today, and also the endive bar. And those are all vegan, gluten-free. <laughs> um, I also have some kind of fun uh, DIY things like floral arranging in here. Um, in the book. So this is a, a small floral arrangement that you can make just using scotch tape in a bowl. Here's one more shot of the, the deck and just sitting outside. This is a shot, um, if you don't mind playing the video, um, of that aerial shot. So a friend with a drone came over and took this view off the deck. <laughs> um, just to give a sense of kind of where we are, deep in the woods. But as we're, we're looking out, we're looking west and that's like Pescadero, Half Moon Bay area out there. Um, and yeah, it's just such a beautiful area. And it's been so inspiring to me in so many ways, being in California and being surrounded by trees, I think, changes your energy somehow. For me, it's, it was very quieting to leave, to leave the city and be suddenly in a very different kind of quiet space. Um, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? We can go, uh, you know, it takes you it took me in a very different place creatively. I feel like if I didn't have that, that shift of space, both mentally and physically, I, I might not have um, had the creative um, shift to be able to even come up with this idea. It's like so different than what I was doing before in New York. Um, and I think my vision of what I, I hoped I might become that year when I, when I was 22 and I moved to New York to be a photographer, what I thought my goal was then is very different than what I ended up doing now, but I think I like this better. So you never know. <laughs> um, so that this Forest Feast Gatherings came out in 2016. And I feel like after, well, let's see, five or six years in the woods, two babies later, um, we were kind of ready for some even more new inspiration. So we decided to shift it up a little bit. My husband had a three-month sabbatical um, fall, last fall, a year ago fall. Um, and we decided to um, go to Europe and spend three months traveling with our two kids. So we had a baby and a toddler at the time. And um, we decided that we would go to Barcelona first to get back a little bit of that city vibe. So we, we spent a whole month in Barcelona. 
Then we traveled along the French Riviera, and then we did a big road trip around Sicily, and also hit up northern, uh, northern Italy, the Liguria area. And then we ended the trip with about a month in Portugal. And so that whole experience, um, I went into it with the hope of making uh, a Mediterranean cookbook. So through that whole trip, I was taking lots of photos and um, tasting lots of things, of course, tasting vegetarian things, but keeping an eye on the traditional meaty things to think about how I could sort of um, you know, shift things to be uh, vegetarian, take traditional local dishes, but put a twist on them to be uh, vegetarian. Um, there's just me having a, having a glass of wine in Cinque Terre, having a grand old time. <laughs> ah, having some coffee. And this is what I actually looked like most of the time. <laughs> Baby sleeping strapped to my belly with a camera in hand. <laughs> um, but it was an adventure and I learned so much about food and travel and exploring local flavors. This was the farmer's market in Antibes in southern France, like right near Nice and Cannes. Has anyone been there before? Antibes? Yeah. So beautiful, it's amazing. Everyone should go there. But they, we stayed right next to the, the farmer's market there and we would go every day. And uh, we kept buying the radishes. They had these beautiful, um, just these beautiful radishes that we would buy with like the, the butter from the farmer's market that probably was made not too far away. And um, the flavors were so intense because everything was just so local and so, um, you know, plant inspired. Even though, of course, there's lots of um, meat in, in French food, but the, the use of vegetables, even in winter, was um, very impressive to me. So I took note of different um, foods grown there and then took it back to our cabin in the woods to uh, develop recipes based on inspired, um, you know, inspired by the, not only the dishes, but the produce grown in the places that we visited. So this was a dish inspired by that Antibes market. Um, they had the most incredible cherry tomatoes all on the vine, just like all lined up perfectly <laughs> at the market. Um, and so I roasted them and put them with some torn mozzarella and capers and a little bit of lemon zest and some really good olive oil sprinkled on top and flaky salt. And um, you just put it on a little piece of French bread and it's delicious and so simple. And here's another example. So these are recipes in my upcoming book um, that will be out uh, in September and it's called The Forest Feast Travels. And it's totally based on, on this whole trip that we took. So this was part of our um, Sicily road trip. And um, this is at the top of Mount Etna, uh, the active volcano. <laughs> and this was a region known for its honey and pistachio uh, production. Even at the top, like in the lodge, at the top of the, of the volcano, that whole honey tasting. <laughs> it's all like local honeys. So cool. So I thought, what can I do with like honey and pistachios? And in my other books, I, I always have a shortbread recipe. So I thought I'm going to combine the honey and pistachios into my, my shortbread recipe and have that be inspired by Mount Etna. And there's that shortbread. And I'm always like scavenging for dishes and looking for um, different backdrops for a lot of the backdrops in the next book um, because I didn't want them to be on, on moss because we weren't talking about the woods as much anymore. <laughs> um, I printed out uh, large posters of a lot of the photos that I took while on this trip. So I intentionally, while we were traveling, took photos of cool looking walls and tile and rock and um, just all kinds of kind of textural backdrops and then printed those out really big and I use those as my backdrops. Because it just wasn't feasible to shoot all the food while we were traveling, so. This is pasta a la norma, inspired, inspired by Taormina. Here's a beet pasta, where you just grate raw beets and uh, mix them in. This is a pasta making class in Italy that was so much fun. I had tried uh, many times to make pasta from scratch. Has anyone made pasta from scratch? Yeah? Good, good results. I found it so challenging. I don't know why. I just couldn't get like the texture quite right, like all by hand. I didn't want to use like a pasta maker um, attachment or anything. But um, anyways, I took this class, and it's, it's just eggs, flour, and um, like a, a very small splash of water, and that's all you need. And it's delicious. So, Chef Luca, in Manarola, Italy, help me with the fresh egg pasta recipe. <laughs> Couple more shots from the book. So I did um, some paintings kind of inspired by the tile, especially Lisbon had amazing tile everywhere. 
Um, so this is a shot from a wall in Lisbon, that tile backdrop, and then I sort of used that as inspiration and also painted some tile-like backdrops that were watercolor. And again, sort of mimicking the watercolor um, pattern at the top based on the tile um, that I used in the shot. Here's an action shot shooting in Italy. <laughs> Another, oh, this is a little video if you don't mind playing. So this is, um, you know, everybody was drinking spritzes in Italy, Aperol spritzes, which is like this bright orange liqueur with a little champagne or Prosecco and um, a little seltzer. So uh, I had to include that. <laughs> I did a slight variation on it, but um, it was inspired by these Aperol spritzes that we tried in Italy. Did a really fun wine tasting tour in Italy, um, hiking in the vineyards above the ocean. The very, very small um, family wine producer that we tried their wines. And there's the cover of the book, um, Forest Feast Travels, that comes out in September. <laughs> Um, so then just as uh, a continuation of my Forest Feast uh, work, I also have some stationery, which has been really fun to develop and a different kind of creative outlet for me. I'm thinking about how my illustration and uh, watercolors can be used to create um, different products that aren't cookbooks, but still kind of maybe help inspire people to cook or take notes about food. Or I'm just always trying to in encourage people to think about, um, you know, being creative in your daily life. It's not always so, so easy to do that, but I think there's certain, certain things that can help. Like cookbooks, <laughs> they inspire me. Some um, placemats that were made with my watercolors. And some more kind of product sketches that I'm currently working on. For dishes and tablecloths and things that I'm dreaming about but not, haven't made yet. Except for I did make some clothes. <laughs> this is a photo that I took of a really big orange tree in Sacramento. Um, it was a really dense orange tree, and I took one huge shot, one photo of it, and it was big enough to be able to, to um, blow up and cover a small couch with, which I did for our house, and then I made us some clothes to wear to a wedding last week, <laughs> last summer too. It's a little ridiculous, but fun. Um, so the cool part about this whole, um, you know, Forest Feast adventure that I've been on and sharing the books is that now it's in 10 languages. Um, and while we were traveling, we saw the book in, I think, every country in that language. So it was so fun to be able to see, and especially, like, online, nothing makes me happier than seeing people making recipes from the book and tagging them so that I can see them. And I feel like it's just spreading the, the vegetable love across the world. <laughs> So I guess when I think about um, what my goal is with the Forest Feast and um, what I hope to do by creating these books and um, sharing my artwork is really to inspire people to get together and eat good food, good healthy food um, that is you know, plant-based, fruit-based, um, grown locally if possible. Um, it's not only good for our bodies, but good for our planet. Um, and my goal is to do that in an artful and approachable way to make it easy for people to, to not only eat that way, but to do it together. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So I have one quick question for you, and then I have a question for the audience. Um, so if you had three tips that you could pass along to probably many of our Instagrammers out there, when they're at restaurants or they're in a cafe and they want to take a picture of the food, yeah. what are some of the things that you think about to tell the story, you know, because we don't have time for lighting booths and all that, mm -hmm. to tell the story as you've done so eloquently, to capture that moment and to get the best sort of contrast? Are there any tips you can pass on? Sure. Yeah. So um, go at lunchtime, <laughs> sit by the window, and do an overhead shot. So um, I think. Dishes always look good when they're lit from either behind or from the side. So if you can place your, so if this is my dish and this is the window right here, I might place my dish right here and shoot from right here or from right here so that I get a little bit of side light or a little bit of light from behind. Um, you can, if it seems um, a little too dark on one side, sometimes I hold up uh, just like a, a white plate or a white napkin <laughs> to bounce a little bit of light back on there. But you know, the portrait mode is obviously great for food shots to get a really close up. But I think I often go for the, the overhead look. And um, I usually don't shoot square, um, but if you do, you could um, center the dish. But if you're, if you're shooting with the rectangle shape for Instagram, um, 
then I like to balance it out somehow. So sort of have it um, be slightly off center. You can crop the plate maybe like by three quarters um, and maybe pull a couple other elements into the corners to kind of balance it out. So I'm often looking for an offset um, balance. So if like my plate is towards the middle, have um, maybe a napkin down here and like um, some flowers up here and then shoot it right from overhead or move that plate over and have something um, down in the corner to sort of balance it out. So um, you're looking for balance in the photo, but not super symmetrical. I like things to be slightly off center. Huge round of applause for Aaron Gleason. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Great.